Hello, ho, ho, everybody. My name is Brady, and I'm a 19th century American historian, and we are back with another React video. And today we're going to be doing more extra history. I said I was going to do something inconsequential today, so I picked the most requested extra history video series that I've gotten on this channel. Kind of counterintuitive, but I am a slave to my whims. I say one thing one day, and then I realize I don't feel like doing that. I want to do this. And that's what happened here. So we're doing the seminal tragedy. I don't know that much about World War I. I'm excited to learn. You guys seem to think that I would enjoy this video, so I have faith in you guys. You've not steered me wrong too often, except when you have, but usually not. Usually you're pretty good. Um, so World War I, the seminal tragedy, the concert of Europe. So World War I is something... I think I'm a little more interested in World War I than World War II, while Americans typically tend to gravitate towards World War II, probably based on our role in World War II. But I don't know. I, I can't speak for other people's tastes. But this should be interesting. Not a military historian by any means. I say this every time, but whenever we have to talk about war, I'm going to say some stupid things. I'm going to say things that are like, uh, duh, here's the answer. Uh, no, 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 what you said makes no sense. You don't know anything about military strategy, all that sort of stuff. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm bad. I'm so bad. All right. So let's get this started. Turn that up. Human history is equal parts heroism, tragedy, and misunderstanding. Oh, this Very looks rarely have we displayed all three to such a degree as in the First World War. Mm. This war is called the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century because without it, there is no Stalin and no Hitler, no fascism oh. or World War II. Without it, we don't have a Cold War that leads us to the very brink of annihilation, nor do we see the Middle East carved up by old men, still bitter from four years of meaningless, self-inflicted catastrophe. Without this war, we probably don't have 9-11 or the turmoil in the Middle East today. This war ushered in the modern age, born in a crucible of gunpowder and toxic smoke and the blood of 10 million men. Bl so this would have led to a completely different present. And there, it's not like everything would have been fine and dandy. We would have had different problems because humanity finds a way, but this is a really good setup and it's very enticing. Uh, I love when these things really show me the consequences of the events they're about to discuss, especially when it's one I don't know, when it's something that is that big. maybe I know more about this than I think I do. Maybe it's just the term that's throwing me off. Who, who knows? Maybe I'll actually know a thing or two about this, just not by the right terminology. Blood spilt in war from the fields of France to the waters off America, from the Russian frontier to the sands of the Middle East, from the Chinese mainland to the deepest parts of the sea. This war broke empires. It shattered the past and forced us to give up our last ties to our medieval understanding. When the smoke cleared and a stunned world climbed out of its trenches, we lived in a new age with <clears throat> new powers, new ideas, and new terrors. It is the mm. defining event of the 20th century. It is the Great War. But it's not the war itself that we're here to talk about today. Hopefully, over the course of this show, a bit at a time, we'll slowly, story by story, cover the sprawling events of this turning point in history. But today, today we are focused on the events that led to this war. For if the war itself is the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century, then the weeks before the war are its seminal tragedy. So I don't know too much about... Al I know there was a lot of intertwined alliances that brought us into this. The catalyst, I'm always told, is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. But then it gets so messy and a little bit hard to follow. I think I need to understand the broader context of European alliances to really appreciate that. And when people try to explain it to me, like, they do a good job, but I feel like I need a flow chart. I, I feel like I need good visuals to explain it. And it may still not be enough until I go a little bit more into the specifics of each place to really appreciate why everybody is so intertwined in the way they are. Why this war, to a lot of people, seemed inevitable. In these next few episodes, we'll focus on the very human, very personal stories that led Europe to consume itself, to ignite itself in one suicidal blaze from which it still hasn't recovered, because it is a tragedy cool. of the highest order. It's like a play, a Greek epic, a story so grand we would think it must be fiction if the scars of the war couldn't still be seen on the fields of France. It's Shakespeare living out before us. It begins with the death of a prince and his lady and ends in mass slaughter the likes of which the world has never seen. So let's set the stage. For a hundred years, Europe has been at peace. 
There have been wars, sure, mm. but they were minor wars. Wars on the periphery. Wars without okay. any of the great powers involved. Not since Napoleon did the great states of Europe vie in bloody battle. This is huge here, and I love learning about the Napoleonic Wars, though it's not my best subject. Um, the break in between is so jarring because you go from Napoleonic military tactics and even me not knowing much about military history can appreciate the difference just the gulf between the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. so much had changed but there's a little bit of influence there I've seen the little things about how people had to I, I guess there were growing pains at the beginning of the war, and there are some remnants of Napoleonic tactics because a lot of the people making decisions are a bit outdated in their tactics, but they end up settling in and figuring out what modern warfare is going to be like, which I think is uh, really cool. For after the ravages of the Napoleonic Wars, the statesmen of Europe had come together to try to stop such a catastrophe from ever happening again. Hmm. They created a system called the Concert of Europe, so that whenever hmm. war seemed perilously close, the nations of Europe would come together in a congress, a conference, and instead come to a settlement that all parties would abide by. Hmm. But Europe has changed since those weary of the Napoleonic conflicts first came together to create the Great Concert. The first and most major change was the formation of Germany. At the time mm. our story begins, it's important to remember Germany as a nation was only 40 years old. It's a young nation, a strong one, a nation looking to claim its own. But to say that Germany was a strong nation is to undersell the magnitude of its creation. Interessant. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to learn more about Germany. I think out of all of the major European powers, that's something I'd really like to know a little bit more about. Germany... Uh, culturally existed a lot longer than it did as a formal nation which i think is a really interesting concept um it feels like it's been around forever um what sometimes when i look at old maps i'll, I'll be like and germany oh, oh wait no it's not germany it's 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 germany's not here yet uh and I'll, I'll kind of forget it because it's one of those countries that just feels like it's been around longer than it has been. There are plenty of young countries, and they feel like young countries. Germany does not feel young. I mean to say that the birth of Germany was something perhaps unique in the history of the world. For overnight, with the signing of a few papers, the middle of Europe was transformed from a thousand tiny squabbling states to the greatest land power the world had ever known. Dude. In one night, suddenly the most powerful nations of Europe, Russia, France, Austria, Hungary, and England, were not the most powerful nations in Europe any longer. Overnight, in the very crazy. heart of Europe, had been created a nation with more manpower, natural resources, and economic strength than any other nation in the world, except perhaps for Great Britain. Hmm. And we get the long-time rivalry of Great Britain and France kind of coming to an end at the result of this and i really love that because it's so weird to think and coming from the 19th century or even going back to the 18th century i guess you could go back hundreds and hundreds of years and you couldn't imagine france and great britain getting along but uh germany is kind of the catalyst for real like cooperation between the two i i guess things have been cool for a little bit as far as I'm aware, um, maybe I'm wrong, uh, uh, but things have generally been kind of cool, but uh, Germany is definitely going to uh, get them on their toes and keep them from squabbling in any, like, petty sense. Moreover, this creation was cemented in the defeat of France, which at the time was considered the Ooh. strongest land power in Europe. And at the time of our story, that defeat and its memory still run deep. And now, look at the world from the perspective of that powerful new German nation. Here they are, arguably the most powerful country in the world, and yet they see themselves being denied all the rights of a great world power. Hmm. Britain and France held territories across the globe. Even the Netherlands, a nation which the might of the new Germany can wipe off the face of the earth in a week, had colonies from Asia all the way to Africa. But Germany, for all of their strength, had been denied those possessions simply because their nation was young. Imagine what this does yeah. to the balance of power. kind of weird. Imagine what this does to the geopolitical scene. Think what would happen today if, say, the entire EU declared themselves a single nation with a single economy, a single military, and a single foreign policy. Imagine if they said that they wanted greater access to Middle Eastern oil, and Russia and the United States said, no, we were here first. 
Imagine now if representatives from Russia and the United States smiled and told this young nation that they'd be happy to continue to sell them oil at an inflated price, though. This was the position Germany found itself in. How was the hmm. concert of Europe? I want that. Uh, I, I just did an alternate history hub video the other day, and I want that one. I, I want the... I, I wonder if he's done it. I wonder if he's done, like, what if the uh, European Union was just a country? That would be kind of amazing. Um, I don't think in, there's any scenario in which that could work out. Um, I mean, the, Great Britain probably wouldn't re really want to deal with that. Germany probably wanna, wouldn't want to deal with that. All of the stronger countries would probably be like, no, we're, we're good here. If we get all lumped into you, it'll kind of dilute our own influence across this. And, and the, maybe the smaller countries would be like, yeah, that sounds great. We'll be brought up uh, past the level of a Great Britain or a Germany, which it's, it's a very interesting concept. Um, yeah. Europe, a system built around a balance of power and compromise to last in these circumstances. And yet, for 40 years, it did. And this brings us to the second major change since the Napoleonic Wars. The men. The 70 mm. years after those wars was a time of giants. Men who towered over the world stage. Time and again here, Europe rolled well on the dice of history and came up with leaders who were capable of navigating an increasingly complex and increasingly modern geopolitical world. Mm. In the 1800s, Russians saw men like Alexander II, who understood that Russia needed to modernize to survive. He began dismantling serfdom, reformed judicial practices, encouraged universities, and pursued peace, understanding that Russia was in no position to fight the major European powers. Like all the men here, this guy was not all chuckles and sunshine. That's an interesting thing uh, about Russia. A lot of its development we associate with uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. They, they came in and like started to really push for industrialization and stuff but moves were being made prior to that and i think that's kind of it's a little too nuanced for my level of understanding there but it's something that i've encountered recently in a, a class i did on the history of the soviet union of course you have a little bit of time dedicated to the transition from the tsarist time to the uh uh, the post-revolution time uh, and it, it's an interesting conversation and I'm glad they're going into this a little bit because it's a subject that I've my interest has been peaked on Alexander II brutally suppressed revolutionaries and separatists in the territories Russia controlled Oof. still he was effective without question by 1900, we have in Russia Nicholas II, a deeply Oof. reactionary, deeply conservative oh, no. man who history records as being of middling intellect with neither the training nor the inclination to properly rule. His reign is a catalog of embarrassing mismanagement. This is the man who fell under the sway of the mystic Rasputin. I, I say this, this is why monarchy fails. There, there's always a, an idiot. The, not, not an idiot he wasn't that dumb i i know enough about him to know that he's not like a complete idiot he just didn't know how to rule in as practical a sense uh, theoretically he should have been fine but uh, practically he wasn't that great but it, if uh monarchs don't re give back a little bit more power to the people then uh this sort of thing is going to happen everything's going to come on uh, it'll come down on that person's head same thing happened with uh with uh good old louis capet you know what happened to that guy this is a man who couldn't even coordinate his own coronation a man who let 1300 people die in a human stampede on the day he was crowned because what a fool. I not, there was not enough beer and pretzels and this uh. is the man who held a ball that day anyway because hey why let a few hundred deaths spoil your day and this is the man who will so out of touch hold the fate of the world in his hands and by this point in Austria, we have as emperor an 84-year-old man, two years away from his death and battered by the weight of the life he's led. His foreign minister, Berthold, is neither a bad man nor a stupid man, but he is a weak and vacillating man at a time when European politics are all about strength. And Germany? Germany, during the 20 years following its creation, had unquestionably one of the greatest diplomats the world has ever seen, Otto von Bismarck. This is a man mm. of great ability and great appetites. A man known to smoke three cigars at once and down a bottle of champagne <laughs> at breakfast. A man who probably deserves an entire episode just to himself, but... That sounds kind of cool. That 
that's he's just showing off at that point like what are you even doing there's no practical reason to do that you're you're just for our purposes he is the man who held the concert of europe together under the incredible strain of the creation of the new german state his life's work was to ensure that france and russia never allied so that germany would never be surrounded this was his hmm. nightmare his greatest fear and in this like in many things he turned out to be right he famously said that the great European conflagration would come from some damn fool thing in the Balkans, and he warned Kaiser Wilhelm II that within 20 years, his bellicose policies would destroy the Kaiser Reich. And he was correct almost to the day. But he was fired by Kaiser Wilhelm II, who has too much historical baggage to get an accurate view of. Okay, um, the Kaiser, and I've had this conversation in the past, I've learned a little bit more about this, but, uh, uh, as far as these titles that kind of have roots that go back to the to not the czar uh, Caesar, uh, we have like the czar, we have the Kaiser. Um, I I believe there was somebody in like Bulgaria who identified as a Kaiser or something like that. I, I don't know. It's something I read in a comment. Don't take my word for it on that. But uh, the Kaiser and the czar, they kind of get thrown out back to back which is kind of insane to me it's really a, a ter it in so many ways this period is a, a turn into a new generation and that's symbolically kind of beautiful kind of terrible when you see especially uh with uh the czar how how poorly that turns out Suffice it to say that the Kaiser often ends up with a reputation for feeling inadequate. Having been born with a withered arm and grown up hounded by his mother, he came to believe that he had to prove he was masculine, and so set out to break with Bismarck's that policies to and show that he was his own man by abandoning the German alliance with Russia Dude, and moving Germany towards a much more expansionist stance. He was known for being brash and impulsive, with little tact, crumbling oh, yeah. the carefully balanced alliances that had for so long kept the concert of Europe in place. Now to all this, we have to add one last piece to the stage. Fear. The fear of the dying empires. The fear of those once great nations that now so clearly saw the shadow of death approaching them from behind. The Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Russian Empire. Mm. The Ottoman Empire was long known as the sick man of Europe. Its decline had been long and slow, with the surrounding nations taking bites out of its carcass as it slowly died. The Austro-Hungarian Empire looked at the fate of the Ottomans and saw shadows of what was to come. They feared they'd be like the Ottomans, dismantled, taken apart piece by piece until they were too weak to fight back. They had once been the most powerful state in Europe, but they ruled over many nations and many peoples. And this, uh, I, I guess yearning for previous greatness is something that I've seen all over. You even see it today. There are people in modern day Turkey who idealize the old ottoman empire which i find rather interesting and I, I would like to learn a little bit more about how they are educated over there uh, and how they teach about the ottoman empire because i think that would be a really interesting uh, thing to study like how people are educated on that subject over there um hmm thoughts just thoughts and over the 19th century, those peoples had asserted themselves, crying out for their own nations, crying out to be free, to, as people, decide their own fate. And so, through the 19th century, the Austro-Hungarian Empire saw its territory chipped away as the other great nations of the Concert of Europe ruled in their conferences that those people had a right to be free. And with each loss, those peoples that the Austro-Hungarian Empire still maintained control of agitated for their own freedom to a greater and greater extent, causing unrest that rocked the empire to its very core. And lastly, we have the Russians. The Russian oh, the Tsars Russians. ruled the largest country in the world, but like the Ottomans, their military, economy, and infrastructure were woefully behind the times. And in 1905, when the Russians lost a war with the Japanese, the first time a European power had lost a war to an Asian one in modern history, their weakness became eminently clear to the world. That was huge, and I've recently read a little bit about this, and that was, like, huge both for Russia and Japan. It, like, validated japan in the eyes of the west as like a, a powerful force and obviously there's the national pride of russia that's going to be in question and they're not that far away from a revolution this is not what you need the world 
This loss caused a revolution that forced the Tsar to go. accept a parliament and a constitutional monarchy. But it wasn't in Yippee. the nature of Alexander II to accept a parliament, and he rebelled against these constraints, leaving his country precariously perched on the verge of revolution. So with a new superpower in the midst of Europe, fear driving crumbling empires to irrational and desperate decisions. I wonder how much uh, the Tsar knew about Louis. Because uh, there's so many... Uh, Louis the Sixteenth. There, there's just so many parallels here. He, he's like that same kind of like m failed monarch uh in a lot of the ways where louis probably could have been fined if he did this this that or this uh, and you never really know uh, uh nicholas is seemingly very similar they're both uh generally weak people who inherited the uh inherited a uh, a throne essentially and uh just were totally overwhelmed and didn't know when to give didn't know when to take didn't know when it would really work and i don't know what i would have done in their positions uh there are many smarter people than me who have uh theorized on it but it, it's alternate history it's historical fiction you can never really know what would happen and a group of leaders simply not equal to their forebearers at the task of guiding the ships of state, the players are all in place. The stage is set, and the curtain begins to rise on the war to end all wars. Join us next time for an improbable assassination, the death of a prince, and a sandwich which changed history. Oh yeah? I bet you know which part I'm interested in. Um, that was really cool. I'm, I'm excited to do this one. Um, there's so many of these. I want to do them a little bit more often than I did uh, in 2020. In 2021, I feel like I want to follow a lot more uh, multi-part videos, but we'll see how that ends up going. I want to go through a bunch of these extra history ones because I really love their style. It's really cool. Um, and they cover mostly subjects that I don't know that much about. There's very few uh, <laughs> videos of that really fit within not only my area of study, but my areas of interest, like not just the years, but like the specific kind of things that I like to study. There's very few examples here. So it's really open for me to learn new things, which I'm very excited about. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like it if you like it. Subscribe for more videos every single day. And that's a about it i think um let me know which one of these extra history videos you want me to do next um i have my eye on one uh sen the sengoku series i i don't know too much about that at all or uh eastern history in general and i thought that would be a cool way to get out of my bubble i don't know what you think about that but that's probably the next one but i'd like to hear which ones you're excited to see um so thank you and i will see you guys next time